Welcome back, Warriors. Gwe Tanse Sego Anibuju. Kwe Nim Deluisi Pam Palmeter, and I'm the host of this show, The Warrior Life. This podcast is a show about living the warrior life, a lifestyle that focuses on decolonizing our minds, bodies, and spirits, but at the same time revitalizing our cultures, traditions, practices, laws, and governing structures. It's also about asserting, living, and defending our sovereignty all over Turtle Island. And sometimes that means that we have to take extra steps to advocate for our peoples. And some of our most powerful warriors are those who advocate for the rights of our peoples, engage in public awareness campaigns and education, really trying to make substantive change. And one of those people have joined us today. Her name is Jordan Marie Brings Three White Horses, Daniel. And she's a powerful Lakota woman who has been just doing amazing grassroots advocacy work on native rights, climate justice, including opposing pipelines that pose risks not only to our lands and waters, but to our women and girls. She's been involved in a long list of organizations advancing Native issues and was even awarded the 2018 Native American 40 Under 40 Award. Like, I honestly cannot believe that she's been able to join us today. She became a household name when she ran 26 miles in the Boston Marathon and prayed for 26 murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls with the now iconic red handprint on her face and the letters of MMIW painted on her legs. Ever since that time, I have been following everything she's saying and everything she's doing. Her efforts at raising awareness for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls in Indian country in the U.S. in such a profound way, outside of the political realm, outside of the legal realm, but just based on her commitment to herself and her people and protecting Indigenous women and girls. And I am just absolutely honored to have her on this show. Welcome to the show, Jordan. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you for that introduction. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I know that you must be so busy. I took one look at your website and I thought, oh my goodness, how is it that you're even able to talk to us today? You're just involved in so many things and you're representing so many groups and organizations on so many levels. So I think it's really important that people who might not know who you are, get to know who you are and this important issue that you're fighting for. So maybe we could start by you introduce yourself the way that you like to and a little bit about your nation. Yeah, my name is Jordan Marie Bring through White Horses Daniel. I am Chloe Chasha Lakota, a citizen of Chloe Chasha Oyate, the lower rural Indian reservation in central South Dakota. Um, and my family and my tribe, we reside on the Missouri River. And so um, understanding that co deep connection to water and our lands really um, came at the forefront of that importance with Standing Rock and No Dapple and the fight to stop that pipeline because that pipeline was going to be going through the Missouri River. And while my tribe wasn't directly in the pipeline route, we would have been definitely impacted if there were to be in an oil spill um, because my community sits right on the river. Um, and so I'm just really appreciative and really grateful for, you know, the journey and the path that I am on and following in the footsteps of some of my, my role models and heroes um, for coming from my family's side in Laura Brawl. Um, and so it's just really a great honor to be doing, you know, this work, bringing our communities together to represent hopefully to inspire our next generations and to continue this hard work that we all do. So maybe uh, you could tell us a little bit about the path to where you are today, you know, your education, your experiences, you know, your background in your community. Yeah, I, because I grew up with my family um, until I was nine years old before I moved to the state of Maine, um, I, I really had this you know, amazing understanding of our people, our way of life, our traditions, our ceremonies, um, and just being surrounded by my family, that was the life that I knew. But when my family made the decision to move across the country um, for my dad's job, that was a big culture shock for me. Mm -hmm. And moving to a very rural community and being, you know, the only kid of color um, at some points 
um, it was really hard and really difficult. And it kind of um, put me on this path of being ashamed of who I was and having to um, face racism and having a hate crime, um, you know, committed on me and uh, that not seeing any sort of justice it was really hard. It was, I was struggling with my indigeneity, my, uh, my identity of who I was as a Lakota girl and a woman um, living in this kind of society and how do I navigate that? So it was a real struggle for middle school and high school. And then, um, you know, but it gave me great insight too. It, not that I say I would want anyone to experience those things, but I feel like it gave me an understanding of how the world works and some of the constructs that we are part of and having to face and having the opportunity to go back every summer to my community and seeing my family going back for the powwows and everything. I got to see not only how beautiful, resilient and strong we are and how we are so communal and just love being together mm -hmm. in our community, but I also, got to have a new perspective of seeing some of the inequities happening within our communities that, um, you know, are continuously being perpetuated and created by the system that we are in right now that doesn't really give much support or a whole lot of visibility to its first peoples of these lands. Um, and so I had that perspective and realized in eighth grade that I wanted to move to DC and be a lawmaker, a lobbyist, or the IHS director, because at that time too, I also saw like how, you know, kind of horrible sometimes the conditions were with IHS facilities and um, kind of just the lack of care and support and the funding that went into it. And so that was one of my dreams was I got to get to DC. I got to be an advocate and a voice and just hopefully help make it a better place for our next generations. And so over time and experiencing what I did and went through and when I got into college, it was still struggling with that, that walking in two worlds of being Lakota and then being Jordan in this society. I, you know, have to give so much appreciation and gratitude to my um, professor in Native American studies who was Native and he saw me struggling. I was a freshman and Going into my sophomore year, I was just really struggling and wanting to go home. And my parents had moved away from Maine um, back to South Dakota. And I stayed in Maine to go to college and to run D1 track and cross country. And I was just really struggling. And he had suggested to me to go to Penobscot Indian Nation, which was just a couple miles down the road. And he was like, go to their round dance. They're going to be having um, a community event and you should go. You should go meet you know, relatives and see if there are any volunteering opportunities you can do um, because I was feeling homesick and really struggling. And I went, had an amazing time and had fry bread and just felt this welcoming community. And if it wasn't for that teacher, I don't know if I'd honestly be in this place on this path that I am today because I was struggling so hard um, and really, really badly emotionally and spiritually and um, just questioning, you know, my potential impact or um, questioning my future of like what I could be doing and struggling in that. And so he kind of really supported me. And from then on, like school got better. I um, was just building this community network of not only Native friends and community elders and, and youth and volunteering or working for the tribe, but it seemed to make everything else in my life go a lot better. Running was getting better. Schoolwork was getting better. I was happier. I wasn't having anxiety or having depression or questioning who I was anymore. And so it was kind of just this like, self reclamation of who I was and reaffirming that I am Lakota. I am an indigenous woman. I come from Kuichasha Oyate and I am damn proud to be who I am and should be proud and should never ever feel ashamed to be me in the color of my skin. And it would just set me on the path that I am now. And it's always been that motivation to keep going, to keep fighting, to keep doing and finding out whatever I can to continue doing and to keep supporting and uplifting and centering the good work that's happening in our communities. And so um, a couple years later, I graduated, 
had the opportunity to move to DC and work with the National Indian Health Board. And we were working on the special diabetes programs for Indians, working on contract support costs, working on native youth health like initiatives and the programs that they were leading in their own communities to address suicide prevention, um, substance abuse and misuse and um, just native youth programming and like peer groups that they were creating. And it was just really exciting to see and really um, heartwarming to see that this work is just happening everywhere across Turtle Island. And after that experience, I, I chose to try and work on the Hill. And so I started working with Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. And it was really disheartening. I, I saw firsthand experience of how hard it really is to get things moving in terms of policy. Um, and I, don't, I was like, maybe I don't have the patience to like wait for this. Um, but I also saw how um, privileged the Hill was and those who were working in the offices. And I took this job for free um, just as experience and already struggling in Washington, D.C. with how everything was really expensive already. I was working multiple jobs outside of that at minimum wage to make ends meet while luckily having support from my dad occasionally. But um, I really I really wanted this experience to say that I, I tried it, um, but I found out it definitely wasn't for me. And it was disheartening because when I'd go to like hearings or seminars that were being held on, on the Hill, I, I really struggled with the people that I was with, that I was being surrounded by. I was there to learn. I was there to find out how is this new potential legislation going to impact my people or communities of color, um, other oppressed communities. And I was surrounded by privileged kids who cared about partying or who talked about getting money wired to their account or, you know, they weren't there for the right reasons. And so um, I chose to, you know, stay in the rest of my, my internship until it ended. And I wanted to find a job that brought me back to the community that allowed me to have more direct interactions with our, our relatives. And so luckily I found a job at the administration for native Americans, um, which was absolutely incredibly fun. I got to help support all of these native led initiatives in terms of business development, economic development, um, environmental regulatory enhancement projects, language revitalization, youth programming. Um, and so every year I was able to like go visit those that were in my portfolio and basically just be a cheerleader for them and be there to help support them in their grant project and making sure that, you know, the budget was there, that they had what they needed, their objective work plan was in place, that they were meeting their milestones and goals and doing weekly check-ins. And it got to the point where like we knew each other's birthdays. We were sending each other Christmas cards and that's what it was about for me. And I, I knew that that's the work that I wanted to be in was having a direct relationship with them, them not just being a number, but actually being an advocate for them in a federal institution, making sure that these federal funds are getting to our communities and supporting the good work that is happening. And then um, simultaneously, I founded Rising Hearts <laughs> when we all saw what happened in Standing Rock and saw the, the human rights violations and the treaty rights violations and seeing our relatives being shot and bitten um, and attacked. That just lit my fire to hold myself accountable and wanting to make sure that I can be a better relative, not only for my relatives present day, but for our next generations and helping to build that pathway, um, ensuring that the future is indigenous, that we are there. And so watching all of the youth lead in that fight and our elders and seeing everyone rising up, it just inspired me to want to be a community organizer and inspired me to become a voice when I did not want to be a voice. Um, it just inspired me to ensure that indigenous presence and voice is there on those platforms that we are being invited to those conversations. And when I saw in DC multiple organizations organizing on behalf of native people about Standing Rock, they didn't have necessarily native people on their stage or on their panel. And I just started inserting myself into those conversations and being like, 
Why didn't you have a land acknowledgement? Why didn't you invite our local Piscataway natives? Why didn't you have a native speaking exactly to these issues of pipelines and climate injustice and treaty rights and um, everything that we're seeing that you're talking about on stage? Why don't you have us included? And so we started building and collaborating and creating these opportunities to bring in the community to support indigenous people and get them centered and uplifted and, you know, co-founding other coalitions to get DC to divest from Wells Fargo and stop fossil fuels um, and just created so many opportunities to bring in the community and also ensuring that not only are we being, building community, that we're intersecting our movements so that we know what is happening with our black brothers and sisters, what is happening with our Asian brothers and sisters and LGBTQ community and two spirits and every group that is being marginalized and oppressed that we are working together to uplift each other at the same time as we are all fighting for justice and visibility and respect. And so um, DC was definitely kind of like my growing and building year, um, but I'm really grateful to have taken that work now to, to Tongva lands, Los Angeles, California, um, and just continuing to do this work of community organizing and supporting and volunteering and creating fun virtual events now since we are in a pandemic to bring in the community together while doing it safely, while also supporting other Native organizations that are doing this work. And so that's been much of my life the last several years is making sure um, you know, that Indigenous people are visible, that we are supported, that we are showing that we are able to control the narrative and that, you know, we are more than the stereotypes that have been placed on us that, I don't know, I just, I want to show all of the good while referencing, you know, the hardships that we do face because those hardships are what motivates us, that keeps us going, that keeps us strong. Um, and that keeps that, you know, that hope and positive outlook as we look ahead to the future. What an incredible story for Native peoples, especially to hear, and our youth, because I think everyone can relate to your experience of, you know, you go to school or you get a job or you have to move and you're, and you're outside of the protective bubble of your family or your nation or your tribe and you really experience you know racism in a whole bunch of forms it can be violence it can be you know hate crimes like you were saying it can be the everyday racism that you just get from other people institutions and that's I mean, that literally attacks at your spirit and it attacks your soul and how you think about yourself and how you feel about yourself, despite what you might know intellectually, you know, so intellectually, you know, well, you know, that's wrong, but it nevertheless has an impact on you. But what you did with that, you know, the fact that you acknowledged this native professor who said, well, you know, go to the local tribe and, you know, hang out at their round dance. And just even though it wasn't Lakota, it's still part of the warmth and community and and culture that is shared among so many indigenous peoples and how that yeah. that's like this fire this hope this comfort that brings you to where you are and all of your experiences and it seemed like as time went by you just kept getting stronger and stronger and your mission just kept getting clearer and clearer and I think you know a lot of youth who might be in a spot where maybe they're depressed or maybe they're anxious or maybe they don't know where to go could find a lot of hope in your story that you know you can put all of that into good energy and and find a way forward to advocate for your people I mean that's just that's just incredible and to hear that you're doing all of this while everything's unraveling in real time. So it's not like we get to just sit in a classroom and learn from history books about things that happened in the past. I mean, literally Standing Rock and what happened at Standing Rock and, uh, you know, all of the bad, but all of the good, this massive coalescing of indigenous nations from all over the world coming together to stand in defense of, you know, sovereign rights and the climate. I mean, that's, what an incredibly uh, powerful experience and to be able to share what you learned and um, all of that 
moving forward is incredible. And, you know, I, I also noticed on your website, it was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was rising hearts. I mean, to know that rising hearts actually comes is born from all of those experiences of, of resistance and resurgence of defending and asserting our rights and our culture and being proud of who we are. What kinds of things does rising hearts do in, you know, in the name of advocacy? Yeah, Rising Hearts really, you know, began in ensuring that Native voices are present in these spaces, um, that we are there. It primarily focused on just networking and collaborating and started off as just lots of phone calls, lots of um, in-person meetings to ensure, you know, this visibility is there. And Rising Hearts was partnering and supporting other Indigenous-led kind of organizing groups during that time. And we were just coming together and kind of emerging and, and um, really making sure that our voices were present in those conversations. And then that led into partnering or supporting the organizing efforts of like Indigenous Environmental Network when um, they wanted to organize, you know, some sort of event at the courthouse because there was a new update with what was happening. Since we were on the ground, um, our whole cohort of Indigenous folks, you know, made sure that we brought people there, that we were bringing in the support to support the tribal leaders um, and kind of just, you know, supporting those other national efforts when they couldn't, you know, come to D.C., um, and then, you know, we were working with some, some leaders that helped organize the Water is Life rally, which was in partnership with the Dave Matthews Band. Um, and then they did that Dave Matthews concert after and fundraiser. And we helped support um, Occupy Inauguration with Indigenous Environmental Network. We helped with Native Nations Rise for Standing Rock. Um, we helped um, on the local and national steering committee for the People's Climate March. We helped organize and bring in over 200,000 people to march in DC for climate justice. Um, and we helped organize like a community round dance after that event. And I felt like I was literally the mom from um, Smoke Signals where she runs out of fry bread. And that was like my biggest panic was like, we don't have enough fry bread. Like people keep coming, like, what am I gonna do? I had people like rushing out to like, go get more flour and like more <laughs> ingredients. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is probably just how she felt. And I just like kept envisioning myself with just ripping the fry breads in half. Um, but it's just putting on events like that to really bring the community together, to bring in allies too, because I, I know there are some, you know, groups within our, our communities that, you know, are trying to go more back to traditional ways and um, some of these more kind of strict outlooks, which I appreciate and I understand, but I also feel that it can create some division, which we do not need right now, especially during this time. And so I'm all about, you know, allyship and spreading that education, but also making sure when the allies come in and support that they are listening to Native people, that they are taking our direction in how we move forward. And so it was creating those community events, creating round dances, creating um, you know, rallies at Wells Fargo to continue talking about why divesting from these you know, big banking institutions that are funding the fossil fuel industry and harming you know, communities of color and violating indigenous rights um, and murdering indigenous people, not just in North America, we have our South American relatives, um, you know, that are heavily impacted by deforestation efforts and oil pipelines and everything. Um, and so Rising Hearts really just focused on organizing events, organizing ways to educate the community and who Native people are, what, what are we fighting for, what how can we control the narrative and put that education out there? Because a lot of the pre, like pre-education out there in textbooks is inaccurate. Um, a lot of what you see coming off on social media can also sometimes be very polarizing and very ineffective and, you know, not accurate at all. And so I wanted to help create these events to bring community together. And so that was really the primary purpose of that. So we focused on pipelines, we focused on youth initiatives, we focused on um, Change the Name, Not Your Mascot. In 2017, we um, created a campaign, the Go Redhawks campaign, where 
we kind of dominated the whole day and showed the world what it would look like if the Washington football team did the actual, you know, right thing in changing the name. And now we actually live to see it. They are the Washington football team. Uh, they didn't get too creative in the name they selected, but we don't see those logos anymore. We're not seeing and hearing, you know, the racial slurs um, and insensitive and harmful comments that come from that team and the behaviors. Um, and so I honestly thought I'd never see that in my lifetime. I thought they were going to be hell bent on keeping the name, but because of, you know, Illuminatives, Crystal Echohawk, Amanda Blackhorse, Susan Harjo, you know, Rebecca Nagel and all of the amazing folks that I have learned from and have organized with, you know, we, we did it like the whole community is, you know, in much gratitude for the community for making that visible and for having that change happen. And then a lot of other primary focus is now, you know, continuing to support and raise awareness about the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and two spirits and relatives. And 2017 with the horrible um, tragedy and death of Savannah LaFontaine Grey Wind, that is what, there have always been moments in my life that have just sparked that, that need to do something. Standing Rock was one, this is another one. And reading what happened to her, and luckily her baby lived and survived and is continuing her legacy um, in memory, um, that, that really lit the fire and was like, I can't, keep tweeting about this or resharing or liking or, you know, throwing a few bucks here and there to support the work, you know, doing this, like, I need to help make this visible because I felt like we were only talking about it within indigenous circles, you know, depending on the case, it sometimes made national news, but oftentimes our relatives, as Anita Lucchesi of the Sovereign Bodies Institute said, you know, our relatives go missing three times. They go missing in life, in the data, and in the media. And so I felt like they were especially going missing in the media and it wasn't there. And so I organized my first prayer vigil for her um, and brought the community together in DC. And then a month later I moved to LA and had the opportunity to speak at the Me Too rally um, where I was with other indigenous sisters. And we really, we really emphasize the importance of the Me Too movement needing to include our missing and murdered indigenous relatives and talking about Pocahontas being our first Me Too and um, really bringing this new perspective um, into this conversation of Me Too and what that looks like and fighting for justice for women and protecting them. Um, and so a lot of my work has been focused on creating this visibility and doing virtual runs or prayer runs to help raise money, um, to donate to these efforts, to donate to the advocates or to the families. Um, you know, it's just been an honor and it's, you know, my biggest passion and my biggest heart work that I will continue to do until I'm no longer here anymore. And it's also allowed me to have a new perspective of my running. I'm a fourth generation runner. I've been competing my whole life. I've been on different teams. I'm now considered a professional runner, as you would call it, and just signed my, my first shoe contract ever. Wow. Um, having that platform, you know, has given me a lot of visibility. It's also brought me to a whole new community. But now in the last couple of years, I have seen how I can use this platform to have these conversations. And in 2018, March 2018 and March 2019, um, that's where I decided to dedicate my bib numbers to the hashtag MMIW or MMIWG. And that was at the San Diego Half Marathon for both of those years, hoping that it would inspire or spark conversations and get people to ask, what does that mean? Um, and it did, and it worked. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't the impact that I was hoping it'd have. And then I luckily had the opportunity um, to go to Boston and be a mentor, um, be a supporter for the five native youth from Wings of America program that were chosen to go to run in the 5k, but also get to have a college visit with Harvard. Um, but I had the opportunity to run the marathon and help fundraise money for, for Wings of America. And it was at that point where I felt like I need to stop forcing this. Like if people are not gonna care, like outside of indigenous communities, like I don't know what else to do. And 
I wanted to find a way to be able to give back, to honor and remember, um, you know, the lives that have been taken by this historical longstanding violence that we have been experiencing in all of our communities. And so I chose to find 26 indigenous women and girls. I chose to dedicate a prayer at every mile, say their name out loud, say the prayer. So I was putting it out into the universe. Um, saying a prayer for their families, for their community. And then I tried to enjoy the remaining mile because it's the Boston Marathon and it was has always been a dream of mine. And for me, it wasn't about running a fast time. It wasn't about, you know, being in this big competitive arena. Um, it was about creating space for them and to give up this, usually that's always a me time um, running has always been about me and trying to push myself to be faster, to hit these goals. It wasn't about me anymore. It was about creating the space for them and letting it be theirs and to hold this space for them. Um, and then everything changed. Everything changed with, I guess it's the power of social media with one post um, explaining why I had the red handprint, why I had the letters on my body, why um, I chose to run in prayer and I, I listed the 26 indigenous women and girls and one of them is my cousin Brittany Tiger um, and really kind of just beginning this conversation of um, you know the intersecting the intersection of sports and advocacy and how this is the platform that I have and this is where I'm going to start bringing these conversations into. And, you know, you always hear, keep politics out of sports. Well, sports is political. And we are seeing that more and more now, especially with our football players. You have Colin Kaepernick kneeling um, to call attention to police brutality and racism that Black relatives are experiencing and facing. And we're seeing that even now during this pandemic um, with the death of George Floyd. And it's calling attention to these injustices that marginalized folks of color have continuously experiencing. Um, but hopefully through running and through sports, you know, that brings people together. And I feel like it creates a safety cushion to be able to talk about these hard conversations. And um, just knowing that this new community of people that are now supporting and learning or donating joining in on these virtual runs that I've been organizing so that they can learn from indigenous voices and perspectives um, has just been really heartwarming. And um, I'm just really excited and honored to continue this work and to see how it transforms and what it transforms into moving ahead. Well, and it's so powerful. I mean, the story is powerful and I'm sure you didn't even realize at the time the impact that it would have. I mean, we saw that and you know those moments and what you were doing and had a profound impact even on those of us who had been run, who had been you know advocating for a really long time and you know just to let you know shortly after that I uh, went to a school to go speak about um, Mi'kmaq sovereignty because I'm from the Mi'kmaq nation and the event started in a school and all of these young elementary girls came out in their dresses and they were all wearing that, you know, the, the red handprint over their faces. And they were doing it in honor of Murder to Missing, but also in honor of you for honoring Murder to Missing. And it was just such an emotional and powerful moment to actually see that, to realize that we all have the power as individuals doesn't matter where we are in our life, how old we are, what we do for a living, you know, our interests, any of it. We all have the power as individuals to make amazing impact on the world and to call attention to injustices, to actually get people to take notice and pay attention. And so, I mean, thank you for doing that incredible work. And, you know, one thing I, I really wanted to ask you about, because there's a lot of young people that listen to these podcasts as well. And we always talk about, you know, what it means to be a warrior in all different contexts, you know, so there's advocates, there's lawyers, there's educators, um, there, there's um, caretakers, there's people who are, you know, life givers and caring for their kids. And we also talk about, um, you know, being a warrior for yourself. 
So in addition to being a warrior for your family and your community and your nation and social justice and, you know, an allyship with everything else, there's also the important part of being a warrior for yourself. And a lot of that, um, a lot of Native people that I've talked to who are involved in sports, it could be lacrosse, it could be anything, really center themselves on their particular sport, like in terms of the physical fitness and the importance that it is to their own mental health and well-being. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about how uh, running is so important an important part of, of what it means to be you. I mean, clearly you come from a long line of runners. Yeah. First, I want to say thank you for sharing that, that story of, of our younger ones with the red handprint. And I think, you know, I never gave enough credit to, I don't know, maybe it's just because of our experience, my experience, our experience of just not having visibility, not having the support. I kind of was a Debbie Downer and looking at it of like, no one's going to care. Um, but I, I, sh I should have <laughs> known better. Um, but having that opportunity, it, it led to me being able to inspire Rosalie Fish and me being able to meet her for the first time and having another Indigenous runner, you know, now running with me for the same reasons. And she's inspiring her network and her community. And it's just growing and having this ripple effect of inspiration and impact and change. And, you know, that's, that's the best thing I could ever have hoped for. Um, but yeah, for running for me has been, you know, I'm a fourth generation runner. It's what I have always looked at as being family and knowing my grandfather was a runner and him taking me on my first run. You know, those were some of the most memorable moments for me in, in my life with him and being able to talk to him about running and talking about times and splits and, you know, talking about races or watching track events on TV or in person or having him come to my, my races. But it's been so much about community for me and so much about my family because we've helped, we've all ran. And I think that also speaks to the much larger conversation of the importance of running in our communities. And um, something that I recently learned on this 360 mile prayer run that I was on with native relatives was learning about, you know, running is medicine, running is healing, running is community, running is tradition. And learning, you know, from, you know, pre-contact, you know, that's how we delivered messages. We were messengers, we were carriers. Um, we have our Southern relatives, you know, who ran, um, you know, their prey, you know, to exhaustion. That's how they hunted. They would run for miles and miles until the animal just collapsed and passed away. And so it running is so rooted into who we are, I think, across so many of our communities and across indigenous communities from around the world. Um, that I think now we are starting to realize and go back to that and um, not always looking at running as this way to be fit, a way to lose pounds, a way to look a certain way, a way to be fast. Now I think we're connecting running um, as a healing tool for us and a way to practice self-care for those that do choose to run. And for me, Running is self-care. Running is a way for me to de-stress, to disconnect from, you know, technology and the work um, and a way to reconnect with myself and to reconnect back to the lands, to my surroundings um, and just kind of get re-centered. Um, and that's something that is always my me time and something that I, I cherish so much, but it's a part of me. It's who I was <laughs> born to be and to do. Um, and hoping, you know, we continue with having, you know, brings through white horses runners in the next generations to come. And so I'm just, yeah, running has been my life. And now my running has new purpose, a greater purpose in being a messenger um, and a voice to speak to these things that are happening in our communities. Well, I think those are really important messages, um, especially for, for youth to realize there's actually a traditional connection to the things that we do. And, you know, things like trade or negotiations or maintaining relationships. And, you know, I've been in awe of some of our brothers and sisters in um, South America 
who win world events in their flip-flops, you know, no corporate sponsors, no training, no nothing, but it's, it's just such an inherent part of who they are. And they talk about the same things as you, you know, about the healing, the journey, the, the connection to the ancestors, feeling like their ancestors are with them. So, I mean, that's, that's just incredible. And the fact that you were able to combine that with advocacy for murder to missing, I mean, that means a lot to a lot of people and meant a lot to those little girls, you know, in Listagush First Nation and means a lot to me. I have worked a long time advocating on murder to missing and had legal standing at the National Inquiry where we were trying to get them to see this as a genocide. And we were so thankful that they actually called it what it is. They did the legal analysis. They looked at the facts and said genocide. And we know that if it's genocide in Canada, that it's genocide in the U.S. too, and that urgent action is needed. Um, yeah. And, you know, before we let you go, I'd really love to hear from you what you think, um, you know, state governments, federal governments, you know, people should be doing about murdered and missing right now, because clearly the profile is higher, but it's still happening. So, I mean, what, what do you think that they should be doing right now to address this crisis? You know, we need to hold the government accountable. They have a federal trust responsibility to be supporting our nations and to be supporting what is happening. And a lot of, you know, the, the inequities and adversities that we face are perpetuated and created by these systems. And so we need to, to elect Native leadership. We need to fill them in um, these congressional leadership roles. Um, we need to make sure that tribal consultation is there and part of the process. We need to strengthen, you know, these communications and relationships um, between our governments. Um, we need to make sure, I mean, it definitely helps having Congresswoman Deb Halen and Sharice Davids um, on the Hill being amazing advocates and voices for these movements, but um, we need to make sure that they're listening to us. We need to be part of the legislative process. We need to be part of that development in, in, in these policies. You know, we just had the Savannah LaFontaine Grey win, um, the act, We've had the Not Invisible Act that just passed House yes the House yesterday. So we're having these um, amazing, you know, potential new laws going to be put in place that is going to put pressure on the government and hold them accountable in creating programs and creating and tra and training and making sure that we're addressing uh, the racism that exists in law enforcement, which always leads to, um, you know, the lack of support in, in supporting the families who have lost their loved ones um, and, and making sure that that connection and collaboration is there between the families, the government, the advocates, the lawmakers that are all part of this process. And, you know, that's, that's something that I try to bring visibility to. I, I, I'm very intentional with every single post that I share on Facebook. While I want to share the good and like kind of this funny stuff to kind of take away from, you know, all the, the bad that could be happening or is happening, you know, I do want to talk about the hard conversations. I want to make visible of what we are experiencing and what we are fighting against or what we are fighting for. And with my posts after a prayer run and I share the names, you know, I, I make sure to be intentional about sharing the statistics that exist to make sure that this is um, being displayed as a real heartbreaking reality that we are experiencing every single day and making sure that I am uplifting the organizations like Sovereign Bodies Institute, Butterflies and in Spirit. We have National Indigenous Women's Resource Center and so many other coalitions and groups, organizations that are all focusing and centering their work on ending you know, gender-based violence or eliminating this violence happening to our relatives and putting forth community programming or initiatives that provide safe housing, um, that is addressing domestic violence, sexual assault, human sex trafficking, um, making sure that that information is always included with my posts so people can, that are non-Indigenous can click on them, can th donate to these organizations and efforts to keep that work going. Um, and so I think government wise, they need to start listening to us and 
now more than ever as we we're facing a, a new election and after I just finished a four page rough draft for an article that I'm writing talking about how important it is to get out the vote. While I know these candidates are not everyone's favorites, there is no perfect candidate. I know many are disheartened to participate in a colonial democratic process, but at the same time, it's about our future generations. It's about looking at the bigger picture of protecting our native people and ensuring that we have the right to vote, ensuring that voter suppression is eliminated, ensuring that we are voting for candidates that'll truly listen and include native people in this process. And so, yeah, I, I'm all about right now just making sure that we, that I'm inspiring people to vote, um, that it's about voting for our next generations as you know our, our ancestors have before us. Um, I know it's a very troubling and hard topic, but it's something um, that I think that you know we should we should be doing. Well, that's really good advice because for for all of the education that we do, all of the colleagues that I work with, we don't just focus on education for informational purposes. We're very much focused on education for action. So we yeah. always end, you know, like for me, I end my podcasts or my videos with what can we do to help? And, you know, if you're in the US, um, voting is something you've suggested. Um, donations is something that's always critical. There's, there's, you know, all of these organizations, you know, and communities are grossly underfunded, you know, treaty rights haven't been implemented, um, you know, land theft and resource theft. But for people in Canada, or say in other countries, what would you say they could do to help support you in your advocacy? Yeah, they can go to my website. My website, um, I just launched last week. And not only is it detailing my lived experience and the work that I do, it details what Rising Hearts does. It details a lot of the programming of what we are trying to do um, and providing masks and PPE and hand sanitizer to our communities through Metakli Ariasin, um, you know, MMIW work. Um, but also I'm, I'm, I'm creating this website to be a streamlined resource for people to hear and learn from not only native people, but from black people, mm -hmm. from LGBTQ, from two spirits and Asian immigrants, um, basically every resource possible, list of books for you to read, to help unlearn and relearn how to become a better ally and supporter in these intersecting movements in the fight for justice and podcasts to listen to, articles to read, um, creating a calendar of, of events for folks to sign up for and to participate in or either just learn from the organizers and voices that are in that um, event. Um, and so it's just basically a streamlined resource um, just to, have that education there and also having a community page to really uplift and give visibility to the work that is happening. Um, so I, I have a contact form. People can contact me. You can select a box if there's a certain selection that you want to use. Um, if you are Indigenous yourself and you have amazing work that you need help getting visible, like let me know. I am more than happy to share that on my, my page and resource to help provide more support, support for you. I'm all about, you know, collaboration and I'm really even more about uplifting and centering the work that is happening. And so um, definitely use my website as a, as a resource, not only to learn about me and the work, but all the work that is happening in the communities. Um, and then you can follow me on Instagram at native in underscore LA and at rising underscore hearts on Instagram. And you can look for rising hearts and native perspective on Facebook. Um, I have community pages there. And I think another way too for folks, indigenous or non indigenous, if you have a platform, if you have connections, it's all about creating those spaces to have these conversations. And so something that I really advocate when people ask me, what can I do? How can I help? How can I give visibility? I, I always start with like, who do you know? Like, who are you connected to? Who, who can we work with to create this platform or a panel or an event to help have um, and expand 
these dis conversations and these discussions. And so um, if you have those connections and opportunities, definitely I'm all about sharing the wealth and creating that visibility for everybody. Um, and so if you have that access and means, please do so. Well, that's perfect advice. Literally, I mean, that's what we're all engaged in. This podcast is about lifting up your voice, lifting up the work you're doing, and then connecting people to your website and all of your resources. And you connect those people to other websites and resources. And that's how we're going to do this in solidarity. And it really gives me a lot of hope seeing that it's not just Indigenous peoples doing this anymore. We're working together with Black Lives Matter and women's groups, anti-poverty groups, environmental groups. I mean, literally social justice and earth justice impacts us all and, you know, other uh, oppressed groups. So thank you for sharing your experiences, your very personal story, um, why all of this matters matters and for literally putting all of these resources on one website it's very difficult sometimes for you know indigenous or non-indigenous peoples who want to act in solidarity to try to find it within the noise that is social media i mean social media yeah. as you know is overwhelming the internet <laughs> um but you, you've really put it all in one place and and thank you for that because it makes it easy for people to find ways to help. And um, I can't thank you enough for all of what you do and all of what you represent and how proud you make me to be a native woman. And, you know, by the work that you do, I mean, you're literally an ambassador uh, for us. And I know a role model for young kids, at least in, in my community, it was, a, <laughs> it was a, definitely a role model. So thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge. Of course, Lila Palamayaye, thank you so much for, for reaching out to me and for this opportunity. And thank you to all the podcast listeners for tuning in again. And like I said, I'll post links to everything um, that Jordan was mentioning, most definitely her website so you can find ways to help. And please share this podcast, share this video, share the information so that people, other people can find out about the important work that she's doing. And then most importantly, after learning more, after hearing more, after seeing more, then find a way that you can take action. And that's what this is all about. Education for action, because we're all in this movement for social justice and earth justice. And we can only do it when we're all working together. Thank you to all of my listeners and viewers for participating and taking action. I love hearing about what it is that you're doing and who it is that you're lifting up. Till next time, keep living a warrior life. Walaliag.